The next item of business is debate on motion 17504 in the name of Dean Lockhart on realising Scotland's potential. May I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Dean Lockhart to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish Conservatives will use our time today to set out a new direction in economic policy and a comprehensive new approach to skills and training. The need for a new economic model has never been greater. Last week, the SFC forecast that Scotland's economy will continue to underperform for the next four years. As a result, income tax revenues are forecast to be £1 billion lower than expected. While there's no doubt that the outcome of Brexit is creating uncertainty, this economic underperformance stretches back 12 years. According to Spice, had growth in Scotland kept pace with the rest of the UK over the last 12 years, our economy would be £7 billion larger. And we agree with the recent comments of the Fraser Vallander when it said Brexit should not be the only focus of attention. There has been little discussion of the structural challenges and opportunities facing Scotland's economy. I, I will later. Uh, that's why we will today set out measures to address those challenges and opportunities. Looking first at Scotland's trade, more than 60% of our business is with the rest of the UK. But enterprise policy does not reflect this economic reality. The Scottish Government has set up more than 30 trade offices across the world, but only one trade office in the rest of the UK. No business in the world would neglect its single biggest market in this way. If we can increase our trade with the rest of the UK by just 3%, that would be equivalent to a 10% increase in our trade with the entire European Union. That's why we have announced policies to establish a series of trade hubs across the UK to help Scottish business become part of the supply chains in the major economic regions of the UK. We also need to equip Scotland's business to expand into new markets, fast-growing economies such as China and Southeast Asia. Those countries are moving their global trade onto e-commerce and other technology platforms. We need to ensure that Scotland keeps pace with these developments. At the moment, only 9% of Scottish business embed digital in their operations. That's why we have proposed the creation of an Institute of Technology and E-commerce, an agency that would work together with a new Scottish Exporting Institute to help up to 3,000 firms a year move their business online to access new markets. We're also proposing the creation of a new Scottish diaspora network. There is a powerful Scottish diaspora across the world ready to help Scottish business expand into overseas markets. Our proposals would see a new global diaspora network with more than 5,000 active members across the world helping Scottish firms expand into these new markets. This new, new network would also tap into the expertise of the Scottish domestic diaspora, Scots with significant overseas contacts and connections who have returned to Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, these proposals would help Scottish business increase global exports and in turn productivity and wage levels. They can be actioned today using the existing powers of the Scottish Government and with no additional funding required to the overall enterprise and skills budget. Now, I'll give way to the Minister at this stage if she wants to uh, intervene. Uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you, Member. I'll do an intervention on another point, but in the spirit of consensus, the point around attracting skills, particularly in digital, one of the biggest threats to that is the restrictions on freedom of movement, which some businesses have called uh, an obstinate approach and neglecting business interests. What does the Member say to that? Dean Lockhart. Well, I think immigration will continue to play an important part in Scotland's economy, but, but it's a derogation of duty if any government ignores the training needs of its young people and instead looks for immigrants trained in other countries to address the skills gap. Uh, Presiding officer, I would now like to turn to proposals to introduce a comprehensive new approach to skills and lifelong training in Scotland. The need for a new approach is clear. The forecast last week from the SFC show that Scotland has become a low growth, low wage and low skilled economy. We need a new skill system that values a vocational education every bit as much as an academic one. The first thing that we are proposing is to replace the current school leaving age of 16 and instead introduce a compulsory skills participation age. This would mean that young people would either stay in educational training until the age of 18 or if they want to start work earlier, it would be through a structured apprenticeship or accredited training programme. This will ensure that they are receiving relevant ongoing training for their future needs. This skills participation policy, by focusing on those who leave school, I will in a second, 
This skills participation policy will focus on those who leave school without going into education or formal training, and it would be targeted at those most in need of extra help and support. It's a policy based on an approach championed by the IPPR late last year. It would not only transform the number of young people getting the training they need, it would help address the skills gap in the economy, and it would help reduce the attainment gap between children from rich and poorer areas. I'll give way to the member. Thank, Claire thank you very much for taking the intervention. Um, given your commitment to keeping people in education and training, can you explain why the UK government did away with the educational maintenance allowance, which we have maintained in Scotland for the very reason of keeping people, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds, in education and training? Members should always speak through the chair, please. Dean Lockhart. I'll, I'll come on to that point later, but what we're announcing today is a comprehensive set of new proposals that address the skills gap that the SNP has created. <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, it's not just young people who need a transformation in the level of support for training. We need a comprehensive new system to prepare our workforce for rapid changes in technology and for workers who will sev have several jobs in their career. To achieve this, we would introduce a new lifelong skills guarantee. A proposal that government, helped by business, would guarantee that anyone who wants to retrain or upskill during their career will get the chance to do so. This would see the introduction of a new scheme where firms and workers can invest in a personal learning account, match funded by government for the lowest paid and lowest skilled, to be used for lifelong retraining and upskilling. This new policy of a lifelong skills guarantee would also include the expansion of lifelong apprenticeships aimed specifically at workers over 25 to ensure that apprenticeships are available to all workers who want one. This increasing emphasis on vocational training and lifelong learning would be supported through a series of additional measures. First, the expansion of vocational focused schools for talented pupils aged between uh, 14 and 16 who are disengaged from traditional education. We want to see the creation of a vocational focused school in every Scottish city, modelled on Newlands Junior College and aimed at talented pupils who do not benefit from a mainstream education. We would also introduce second chance centres in areas of needs across Scotland to give people another chance at getting the core skills they really need. Second chance centres would offer basic qualifications in core subjects and could be set up within colleges, job centres or as standalone organisations depending on the approach most appropriate for the, for the local area. Deputy Presiding Officer, the measures I have outlined today would represent a transformation in the training and lifelong learning opportunities across Scotland. Those most likely to benefit are the lowest paid and lowest skilled and those most at risk from the changing nature of work. After 12 years in government, the SNP has failed to deliver sustainable economic growth and we have a skills system that is not fit for purpose. It is time for a new approach. We have today announced ambitious proposals that would transform the skills system in Scotland and boost economic growth. And in the months to come, the Scottish Conservatives will be announcing further proposals which will grow Scotland's economy and deliver on Scotland's true economic potential. I move the motion in my name. I now call Jamie Hepburn to speak to and move Amendment 17504.3. Uh, six minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Let me move the amendment in my name at the outset, lest I forget at the end of my contribution. President Officer, I very much welcome the opportunity this debate it provides and affords us to outline the strength of Scotland's economy and its labour market. I also welcome the opportunity to recognise the drive and resilience of Scotland's business community and what I believe are shared ambitions across the Chamber for future success. We know that a strong economy is essential to supporting jobs, incomes and the quality of life alongside growing competitive and innovative businesses. Our economy must also be environmentally sustainable and inclusive, involving and providing benefit and opportunity for all of our people and all of our communities. The value of Scottish Government's commitment to securing a sustainable and inclusive economy is, I believe, widely recognised both here in Scotland and beyond. A distinctive approach is built into the national performance framework which provides a, a purpose not just for government but for the whole country. Through the NPF we measure that performance through a range of outcomes that are consistent with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There is though I recognise much still to be done to ensure our country continues to flourish while increasing well-being for all and tackling the global climate emergency. The greatest challenges we face in 
being able to deliver the Scotland of our ambitions are the constraints and the powers of this Parliament compounded by the uncertainty currently being created by, the, by Brexit and the UK Government. On the 30th of May, in an open letter to the ever-growing list of candidates seeking to become the next leader of the Conservative Party and thus the next Prime Minister, Carolyn Fairbairn, the Director General of the CBI, said of where we stand with Brexit, prolonged uncertainty is damaging our economy now, driving up costs and reducing sales. Stockpiling of raw materials and goods amongst SMEs is at a record high. Billions of pounds in investment are being diverted from the economy, harming future jobs and prosperity. That quote resonates with this government's analysis and from what we hear from business. A no-deal Brexit remains a significant and live risk that would impact significantly on the Scottish economy through disruptions to logistics, to supply, to trade, to investment, to migration, to skills and to market confidence. Brexit is already impacting negatively on the confidence and security of our businesses, regions and communities in Scotland. Whilst we face a significant... Yes, briefly. Dean Lockhart. Uh, Last week, the Fraser Rounder highlighted that Brexit is a UK-wide issue. Why is it then that Scotland's economy is forecast to continue to underperform the rest of the UK? Jamie Hepburn. It, well, he, Mr uh, Lockhart says that we underperform uh, the rest of the UK, but let me, and I was just about to go on to set the strengths of the Scottish economy. I, I, I noticed uh, there was a distinct absence of that in his opening remarks and in his emotion, but let me set out for the record Scotland's economy is growing. Unemployment is at a record low. Exports are growing faster than anywhere else in the United Kingdom and productivity is increasing. Over the past year we've seen the number of people in employment has risen by 23,000. Our exports of goods grew by 6% faster than any other country in the UK. Productivity has grown by nearly 4% compared to 0.5% in the UK as a whole. And business research and development has increased by almost 14% exceeding the growth of 2.9% experienced in the UK. That is the reality of the Scottish economy, Mr Lockhart, not the doom and gloom that you persist in saying in this chamber. And speaking of doom and gloom, let me give way to uh, the member over there. Neil Finlay. Um, I wonder if the Minister will reflect on the uh, continued pursuit of economic growth as a government objective and reflect on what's been done in New Zealand where actually they are proposing that budgets are around well-being rather than the continued pursuit of economic growth, which clearly it runs contradictory to sustainability principles. Jamie Hepburn. Well, I don't uh, concur that it, it uh, contradicts sustainable, sustainability principles. I think the uh, record and our ambitions in terms of, of a sustainable and inclusive form of economic growth are well laid out. I was perhaps uncharitable to the member in terms of intervention because actually I, I do think what's being explored in New Zealand is worthy of our exploration here and I would refer him back to my opening remarks when I set out that uh, issues of well-being around economic growth are firmly laid out as part of the national uh, performance framework. I think it is important for us to lay out, uh, President Officer, in terms of uh, what I have, have laid out uh, uh, a few moments ago. Scotland has the sound economic and labour uh, market foundations to move in a, a different direction, to move in that uh, inclusive uh, fashion. Uh, we have set out a commitment for inclusive growth. That's growth that combines increased prosperity with greater equity that creates opportunities for all and distributes the dividends of increased prosperity, prosperity fairly. Something I'm sure that would be uh, welcomed by Mr Finlay and those on uh, the Labour uh, benches. Uh, turning to the issues around uh, the skills uh, system, let me say again to Mr Lockhart, I just don't recognise what he characterised the Scotland skills system as being. I am in the fortunate position of being able to get out and about across the country to engage with the school environment, the college environment, with young people and not so young people uh, undertaking a variety of forms of training. And I see excellence every single day. I see commitment every single day to uh, uh, ensure that uh, people are equipped with the skills they need. But I do recognise that we do need to do more. We do need to ensure that people are equipped for our society and economy of tomorrow, responding to technological disruption and demographic change. And in recognition of this, we have committed and we will shortly publish our Future Skills Action Plan and we continue to engage with the STUC and the CBI on their proposition for a national retraining uh, partnership. Uh, President Officer, I, I I think I have to come to close, but let me say, I, I, uh, I think the title of today's debate is rather more positive 
than the motion that has been laid before us by the Conservatives. I do believe Scotland can realise its potential. I believe it can best do so as an independent country with membership of the Euro European Union. But in advance of that time, though, this government, as one that's ambitious for Scotland, will continue to work day in, day out tirelessly to ensure that we have a sustainable and inclusive economic future that works for all of the people of this country. I now call on Richard Leonard to speak to and move amendment 17504.4 for five minutes, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Labour Party is always happy to take any opportunity to make our case for real and radical economic change, for more investment and less austerity, for more planning and less market, and for more democracy, because too much economic power rests in too few hands. But I'm bound to begin by making a couple of points uh, to the Conservatives who have called this afternoon's debate. Of course they are right to remind us that once again, in the last quarter, Scottish GDP growth lagged behind total UK GDP growth. But they should not be supercilious. Output from the manufacturing base in Scotland rose last year by 2.6%. For the UK as a whole, it contracted by 1.3%. It was only through a growth in services that the UK rate of output moved marginally above the Scottish rate of output. And secondly, whilst of course it is good to hear Conservative representatives moving a motion in this Parliament in favour of a high wage economy, it is a pity that where they are in government they will not support a real living wage and have presided over the biggest fall in real wages for 200 years, not since the great slump of 1798 to 1822 have we seen a wage squeeze quite like it? So that more than a decade on, the wages of working people are still stuck below the levels they were before the financial crash. And the shameful result is that one in four children in Scotland are living in poverty, and two out of three of them are being brought up in poverty in households where at least one adult is in work. Yes. Liz Smith to the member for taking an intervention and I don't doubt the seriousness of the comments he makes but does he realise that economic growth is absolutely paramount in addressing these concerns and that Labour's policies of high taxation undermine that? Richard Leonard. The critical issue is the distribution of economic benefit from economic growth and that's one of the fault lines in our society <laughs> and to the uh, Scottish Government uh, we say this the last thing that we need is yet another referendum on the creation of a separate Scottish state. And let me say to the ministers and to their party, the people of Scotland do not want yet another referendum on the creation of a separate Scottish state. The figures that the Scottish Government itself produces tell us that Scottish exports to the European Union were worth £14.9 billion in 2017. The value of our exports to the rest of the UK were worth £48.9 billion in 2017. That is, our exports to the rest of the UK are worth three times more than our exports to the whole of the European Union put together. Which is why we want to remain in the European Union, but we want to remain in the United Kingdom Union as well. Because there are too many national boundaries, not too few. We should be breaking down barriers and not building them up. The long-term structural weaknesses of the Scottish economy, slow growth and poor rates of investment, a narrow export base, too narrow a concentration of research and development spending, an over-reliance on foreign direct investment, endemic low pay and low productivity, do not remain unaddressed because we don't hold the powers in this parliament. They remain unaddressed because the current Scottish government has failed to use the powers that it has got in this Parliament. We could have a Scottish industrial strategy with a Scottish investment bank, which does not simply respond to market failure, but which is a proactive catalyst of economic change, led by a government that is prepared to act and not just react. We could have a properly resourced Scottish Economic Development Agency, as well as one for the Highlands and Islands and the south of Scotland. We could have the institutional and investment firepower to diversify 
diversify our export base and boost R&D. We could use the powers of public procurement and skills development to better plan our economy in cooperation with trades unions and businesses. We could make a just transition to the sustainable economy that we need to make in the face of the climate emergency. And we could spearhead with an alternative economic strategy, a radical reduction in inequality, which is something the government's own poverty and inequality commissioner has today chastised them for failing to do, because in his words, very little has changed to stop the rising tide of in-work poverty. So it's time for a wholly new approach. Time to end the low pay economy, the failed policies of neoliberal economics. Time in which we developed a policy based instead on economic diversification, economic democracy, which promotes new forms of ownership as part of a new economic strategy and plan, an economic strategy which puts people first and an economic plan for real change. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now call Patrick Harvey. Mr Harvey, please. Uh, sorry, presiding officer, timings for, for this? Uh, sorry, I thought you knew it. Four minutes, Patrick four. Harvey, four Thank minutes, Mr much. Rennie, but there's time for interventions and time to be made up. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, at one level, I very much welcome the fact that this debate is now beginning to hear a wider range of views on the, the deep question about economic growth, its meaning, its role and its place in our economy, because for a long, long time, it was only the Greens raising uh, a long-standing objection to the fixation on economic growth, uh, or to the primacy that that single GDP metric uh, is given within our economy. The, the chasing after uh, relentless economic growth measured in GDP terms has always prioritized private riches over public wealth, and it is inextricably linked, not only from climate change, but also from biodiversity loss, from the fragmentation, pollution, and degradation of habitats, from the extraction and depletion of finite resources, uh, and the exploitation of human beings around the world. It fails to capture inequality, economic justice, people's health, the state of our environment, or well-being, and it fails to recognize the need to share economic benefits or to protect people from the consequences of economic activity. So I'm not surprised that the Conservative Party have not yet joined us uh, on that, that deep debate about the meaning and role of GDP growth, but more and more people are having that discussion. Uh, I was interested that uh, Neil Finlay raised that question as well. Although the, the Labour motion does mention economic growth, there's much, certainly in the second half of that, that motion, that amendment rather, that I can agree on. Clearly, we're not going to agree on the independence question, not at this stage. Perhaps one day uh, more people in Labour will come with us on that. But even if they don't come all of the way with us, even if they don't come all of the way with us on that, there is a lot more that we could be doing to address low wages here and now if the Labour Party had backed devolution of employment law uh, during the debates in the, in the Smith Commission. We could have repealed anti-trade union legislation to help restore the balance of power in the workplace. And I hope that even if the Labour Party don't join us uh, in arguing that independence uh, should be the, the ultimate uh, trajectory for Scotland. I hope that they will come at least that far in saying that we should be seeing control uh, of employment law. The government amendment uh, I have mixed feelings on. It is clearly a significant improvement to the motion, very clearly a significant improvement to the motion. It does recognise uh, that we shouldn't just be trumpeting uh, low employment and high unemployment, uh, low unemployment and high employment rates, because we need to acknowledge that the, the canard, the notion that work is the root out of poverty, that is broken. That no longer applies. We know that a huge proportion of the poverty in our society now is in work poverty. So the quality of employment matters as well. But the, in discussing the, the, the national performance framework, the motion describes how it should work, not how it does work at the moment. The NPF still prioritizes GDP growth and places far too much emphasis on it. And the, the, the measurements of progress against the NPF also show close to zero progress uh, on issues like poverty, wages, and income inequality. 
the Green Amendment not selected for debate uh, would agree that a new policy framework is necessary, a new direction is necessary, but asks to what end? Uh, just uh, to race ahead with more GDP at any cost? That is not the approach we should be taking. Instead, we should be learning from the likes of the Enough uh, Coalition, which has been launched recently, questioning the notion of growth, questioning what is real prosperity, how do we create it and share it without continuing today's extractive, polluting and exploitative economy. Uh, I look forward to this debate continuing and I'm certain that those questions are the ones that all political parties are going to have to face up to uh, in the coming years and decades ahead. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. I call Willie Rennie. Uh, I was very pleased with Richard Leonard's contribution this afternoon um, because it gave a very unequivocal position on Europe. And I think that is to be welcomed. Uh, I was waiting for the caveat. I thought there might be something coming. Uh, and I hope the fact that there was no caveat, I think, hopefully gives us a positive view that will maybe try and influence Jeremy Corbyn in London to adopt a similar position. Because it is coming to a critical point now where the Labour Party does need to stand up on Brexit, because this is critical to this whole debate about skills and the economy and the opportunity uh, within the country. So I welcome that contribution, and I hope it has an effect uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, but, uh, certainly. Neil Finlay. Can I ask what influence he had over the coalition government that his party was a member of that cut budgets in all of these sectors across the UK? Uh, Willie that, Rennie. That was a nice try, Neil Finlay, um, but um, this is a debate about the economy and about the future of this country, and we can have another debate about that at any time he wishes. I would be delighted to have that debate and about the performance of the Labour opposition within the last three years on Brexit, because it has been woeful in its performance. So what we need to do is to try and focus on the big challenges that Scotland faces, and I believe the, the answer to this is around about participation in our economy because that helps our economy grow, but it also gives opportunity for individuals to succeed, which is why we are so strongly in favour of early intervention, particularly around about nursery education and the pupil premium or the pupil equity fund, as we call it in Scotland, because it gives people and young people the foundation that they require in order to grow their skills and get work in the future. So participation, I believe, is the answer to the sustainability of our economy, but also opportunity for everyone. But I have to say the start of the debate this afternoon was a fruitless trading of statistics on performance. There is marginal difference on growth, on productivity and unemployment. And to argue over that as if it's significant is pointless, it's fruitless. What we need to recognise that there is a massive hurdle, a massive cosh that's been created over our economy just now because of the threat of Brexit and because of the threat of independence. Both are as bad as each other and both governments and both parties are as bad as each other if they think these differences are significant. What we need to recognise is the constitutional upheaval that's been imposed on our country for the last 10 years has had a significant impact on our economy and we need to make it stop if we're going to give people the opportunity in our country to achieve more. So the skills shortages and workforce shortages in this country are at the heart of our problems too. Today I was meeting with pharmacists. There's a big shortage of pharmacists. GPs I heard about yesterday, massive shortage of GPs in our country. Nurses, processing business are struggling to get the workforce they need. The farms, hospitality sector, engineers. There's massive shortages in skills and workers right across the country. And part of that is down to freedom of movement, the inability and the fear that we're going to be cutting off our opportunity to attract people from other parts of the globe, including Europe as well. But some of the problems are born here too. We've heard this morning about the colleges where they're having real problems uh, with their finances. This has gone on for years. We know that the SNP government cut massive number of places in the colleges year after year, and the effects are still being felt. But the apprenticeship levy is not working either. The number of businesses that tell me they're cutting their training budgets rather than increasing their training budgets because of the apprenticeship levy. If that's the effect that it's having on training in our businesses, then it is not working. And the final one, and I hope the Minister addresses this in his uh, conclusion, um, is the last time Jamie Hepburn, uh, that I attended the debate here, um, he was talking about the 
the efforts to try and deal with grants going to businesses, regional selective grants going to businesses. He said there was going to be immediate action to clamp down on that, and I hope he does um, include that in his summing up remarks, because I've not seen any evidence yet uh, that that policy has been implemented. There was a debate about whether it was a pilot or not. I'd be interested to get an update on what effect that has actually had. And finally, on his business pledge, 99% of businesses in Scotland have not signed up to his business pledge. Have more of them signed up since the last debate? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Rennie. Open debate. Uh, speeches of four minutes with time for interventions. I call John Mason to be followed by Liz Smith. Mr Mason. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I'm very pleased to take part in the Conservative debate on the economy this afternoon. And the first part of their motion that I would really like to focus on is where it says the need to address the skills gap in the economy. Now, it certainly is true, as others have said, that there are skills shortages, but that is not because we have loads of unemployed people, we're at a record low of 3.2%, or people with the wrong skills. Rather, the biggest problem is there is a lack of people. When we went into the Union in 1707, something like one, we had one-fifth of the population of England. Now it is more like one-tenth. It is very hard to grow an economy if the population is not growing. It is a failure of the British project since 1707 that England's population has grown much more than Scotland's has. Scotland has been let down. Agriculture, construction and tourism are all sectors which are dependent on the EU and other workers coming to Scotland. Tourism specifically is worth some 9.7 billion to the economy, and EU citizens are reckoned to make up 13% of the local tourism workforce, 15% of the accommodation sector, 19% of hotels and restaurants. So if boosting Scotland's economy is linked to growing Scotland's population, how can we boost the population? Well, how about one, being part of the European Union, as that would allow free movement of workers? And how about two, relaxing our immigration policy so that more people could come here and be able to work? But of course, the UK is going in exactly the opposite direction. The UK wants to leave the EU and stop free movement and tighten immigration policies. Therefore, it seems that the UK is deliberately following a policy which will damage the Scottish economy. Is the UK consciously following a policy in order to damage Scotland? Well, even I do not think they're probably quite as bad as that. But at the very least, they are pursuing policies without considering the negative impact on Scotland. When the Economy Committee, committee conducted its... Uh, briefly, yes. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thanks very much. I'd just like to bring John Mason into the 21st century and refer to last week's uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission report. It blamed the billion pounds black hole in the Scottish budget on low wages and the fact that there is now a low wage and low skills economy. Does he not think the priority is to focus on increasing skills and skills participation in Scotland? John Mason. Well, if the people aren't there, I don't know how we can improve the skills, but I'm happy to make some comments further on about skills training. But you might also note that, that bringing it right up to date, this afternoon uh, at 2.32 approximately, the NFU S issued a press release about the lack of people for the agricultural sector, and perhaps his party should be a little bit more worried about that. When the Economy Committee conducted its inquiry into the Scottish economy a few months ago, we found we compared very favourably to most of the English regions, Wales and Northern Ireland, but we're always struggling to compete with London and the South East. As I think has been said by the Lib Dems, if I remember correctly, London is like a black hole sucking life out of the rest of the UK. On the question of the spread of skills available in our society, the Economy Committee has touched on this as part of our inquiry into the construction sector. That report will hopefully be published in the next few weeks, but we have heard of a shortage of several uh, skills, including technical skills. Young people have given us evidence, including that the schools are pushing university far too much and the schools treat trades as a last resort. This should not be the case. We want able young people spread across our economy and it would not be ideal if every young person went to university. So if the Conservatives are arguing that more and more should go to university, I, for one, would be questioning that. Now, I think it's also worth considering here the gender stereotypes, which are still impacting the choice of career of many young people. I'm sorry, I don't have time. The members in his last 30 seconds. The economy as a whole is losing out because women are not getting up 
uh, setting up their own businesses at the same rate as men, nor are they going into STEM subjects and construction trades as much as men are. We have to accept that this is a challenge for business to take up, as well as for schools, colleges, Scottish enterprise, and so on. And I was interested in the evidence from City Building in Glasgow that although they only train 4% of all craft apprentices in Scotland, they are actually training 20% of all the female craft apprentices. So there's a lot to be done, but the, my key point in all of this is we need more people in this country. We have to allow immigration. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Liz Smith to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Ms Smith, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I think it goes without saying that the ability to harness the vast pool of diverse skills in the working population of any country uh, matters hugely to the likely economic success of that country. It also goes without saying that Scotland has a very proud history when it comes to the mobilisation of our workforce and we are so lucky in modern times to be sitting on huge potential when it comes to so many different industries which are at the cutting edge of both enterprise and innovation, whether these are in the engineering sectors, food and drink, digital technology or medical science. And just yesterday, Minister, I had the privilege of visiting the Maritime Department of the City of Glasgow College and I saw there at first hand the expertise that makes it one of the top five colleges in the world when it comes to marine engineering. So let's be quite clear that the potential for Scotland to lead the world in so many different sectors is immense. But let's also be quite clear about the challenges that we face when it comes to delivering the success, starting with the recent IPPR Scotland survey, which does predict that by 2030, Scotland will be short of 410,000 skilled workers, a skills gap that is costing Scottish organisations 350 million per year, according to the Open University. And we know too that the size of the shortage in Scotland has doubled since 2011, no doubt a reflection of the fact that four-fifths of Scottish businesses are reporting recruitment difficulties in one form or another. But this should not just be a debate about numbers. It's a debate about the right skills and, of course, about tapping into as yet unused or underutilised potential. For example, the oil and gas sector, one of Scotland's best assets, is reporting that just under half its companies are having to deal with shortages in key disciplines for engineers and IT and technical skills. So it's no coincidence at all, Minister, that Holyrood's Education Committee begins its inquiry into STEM education tomorrow in order to understand better why Scotland is failing to recruit more STEM graduates. The committee will be looking at STEM education in schools, including whether there is any direct correlation with subject availability and choice, what the barriers are to many women entering STEM professions, and why key sectors are failing to attract a sufficient number of quality STEM graduates. These are serious questions about the rich potential of our country. And I think the other worry, however, must be the growth in the number of university graduates who end up in low to medium skilled jobs when it's quite clear that Scotland is, greater, is in greater need of filling higher skilled jobs with the necessary expertise. Because since 2011, we have seen the number of university graduates entering the low and medium skilled jobs rise from 15% to 19%. And we've of course also seen a rise in the number of pupils leaving school with no qualifications at all. And that added to the concerns is something that we have to take uh, very seriously. And all of that, is just one of the powerful reasons for ensuring that all young people are actively involved in training until they're 18. And that is tackling head on some of the concerns of entrepreneurs like Jim McCall, who, believe, who we believe needs to do so much more to be encouraged by the SNP government when it comes to encouraging these positive destinations. Jim McCall is someone through Newlands Junior College who has done his level best against, it has to be said, some very disappointing opposition to provide much richer training experiences for young people who have become wholly disengaged from school. And we believe that his ideas have very considerable merit when it comes to expanding the skills participation programme. We surely need to complement the increased motivation for the majority of young people to stay on at school and training with qualitative, and it is qualitative, opportunities for those who presently leave school with very little to their name and very little opportunity to succeed in the future. That is exactly why the Scottish Conservatives want to increase the training participation rate, rate for those who have not secured an apprenticeship, college place, university place, or for those whose circumstances prohibit them from undertaking additional training. And Deputy Presiding Officer, can I finish on the point that while my colleague um, Dean Locker is absolutely right to talk about the economic policies 
What must be at the core is the skills base of our working population. Thank you very much. I call Gordon MacDonald, be followed by Alec Rowley. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The latest GDP growth rates issued in May for quarter one of 2019 indicates that the UK grew by 1.5%. The Economic Statistics Centre for Excellence has estimated in conjunction with the ONS that Scotland's growth was 2%, the third highest out of the 12 regions of the UK. The State of the Economy report issued in February 2019 by the Chief Economist of the Scottish Government opens with, overall 2018 has been a positive year for the Scottish economy with growth returning across all sectors of the economy, the labour market delivering record levels of performance and further growth in exports. The House of Commons Library briefing published in September 2018 showed average Scottish regional growth between 1999 and 2016 based on annual GVA growth at 1.9% per annum the same as the UK's 1.9% and only exceeded by London on 3.1%. Growth in Scotland's economy is driven by consumer spending, business investment, government spending and export activity. The lack of confidence saw annual GDP growth in Scotland and across the UK drop significantly in 2016 and 2017 because of the Brexit referendum. Yet there is no mention of this in the Tories' motion. The Tories' motion does highlight productivity and wage growth. On productivity, the latest data for Scotland shows a significant rise in 2018, up 3.8 per sorry, 3.8 percent compared to a UK productivity that rose by only a half of 1 percent. No, since 2007. Productivity has increased in Scotland by 10.8% compared to 2.7% in the UK. In 2018, Scotland's productivity was 96% of UK productivity, up from the 89% in 2007 and the 90% it was performing at when the Scottish Parliament was created. The latest regional pr productivity analysis released in February highlighted that Edinburgh was performing 24% better than the UK average, with Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire performing 13% above the UK level. In terms of international comparison, Scotland has a higher productivity than Italy, Spain, Canada, Japan and New Zealand, to name but a few. Regarding the level of wages, over the life of this SNP government from 2007 to 2018, the House of Commons Library highlights that wage growth using the median weekly pay for full-time employees rose in Scotland by 28%, four points higher than the UK average of 24%. The increase in median wages over the 11 years of this government was the highest in Britain higher than London and all the other eight regions of England controlled by the Tories. Of the 11 regions compared by the ONS, Scotland also had the second lowest percentage of jobs paying below the real living wage in the UK. Still too high at 22%, but substantially lower than the 29% in the East Midlands or 28% in Wales. However, these improvements in Scotland's economy are now under threat. The Chief Economist stated a no-deal Brexit remains a significant risk and would lead to a major dislocation to the Scottish economy. In a report for the GMB by the Fraser of Allender Institute published in April found that the EU is Scotland's principal international trading partner with ne nearly 15 billion of exports of goods and services. Over 45% of Scotland's international exports are to the EU, with nearly 144,000 jobs linked to EU demand for Scottish exports in 2015. The Independent Scottish Fiscal Commission last week reduced its growth forecast for 2019 and 2020 as a direct result of continuing Brexit uncertainty, with a no deal worse than our current projections. The and there, I'm afraid you must conclude. Two seconds. No, there you must <laughs> conclude. When I say you must conclude, you must conclude. Uh, I now call, I mean, you've had over your time. 
I now call Alec Rowley to fall by Stuart McMillan. Mr. President Rowley, officer, please. in order for Scotland to realise its potential, we must ensure that Scotland's greatest asset, its people, are able to achieve and reach their full potential. For far too many in Scotland, this is not happening. In further education, we have seen the massive cuts from the SNP government that have had a detrimental impact on colleges, college places, particularly college places for adults. We have to recognise that at the heart of any industrial strategy must be the link to education and skills, and that a modern economy, in a modern economy, skills and reskilling is an essential requirement for good jobs and a high wage sustainable economy. And across Scotland, we are seeing cuts in school budgets as local education authorities struggle to balance their books. Now, the Tory motion talks about a comprehensive new approach to skills and training, but we know that the Tories' plans for Scotland, as they set out in the Scottish budget, would have seen deeper cuts in public services. So you cannot make change and deliver skills on the cheap, and you cannot deliver education on the cheap. So from a party that has cut taxes for the better off, given handouts to big businesses, failed to tackle, failed to tackle tax avoidance, chosen to force austerity onto the poorest, and a party that created Brexit in order to sort out internal division, it is quite staggering that they come along here today and talk up their economic credentials. I'm sorry, I've only got four minutes. You should put in a longer debate. But in the time that I do have left, in the time that I do have left, I want to touch on our amendment and in particular another independence referendum. My own view is that any attempt to hold another independence referendum without knowing the full implications of Brexit would be irresponsible. And even if a Brexit deal is reached this year, which is highly unlikely, we will not know enough to make an informed choice of the Brexit consequences for any independence referendum to take place before 2021. England, after all, is our largest trading partner. So I would ask the SNP government, think again, take the issue of Indiref 2 off the agenda and seek a fresh mandate in 2021 if you still believe at that point that that is the best way forward. I would also, I've got four minutes, I've got four minutes. I would also make the point, I do not believe any politician can tell the people of Scotland that they cannot have a referendum where there is a clear majority support for one. But right now, given all the uncertainty, the threat to jobs and the unacceptable cuts that are taking place in public services, there is no appetite for more uncertainty, more disruption and more division. The majority of people in Scotland want us to get on with fixing these issues. And I have to say to the SNP that bringing forward another referendum is music to the ears of the Tories. They don't want to talk about failed Tory austerity, failed welfare reform, failed energy policy and so on. They don't want the people of Scotland to know that under the Scottish Tory plans there would be even deeper cuts in public services in Scotland. So they are quite happy to frame the debate around the Constitution. The Tories are happy to stoke up division for it creates a smokescreen for their failure to the people of Scotland and their failure to the people of the UK. Let us focus on the big issues impacting on people and communities and get these issues sorted. That's what the people want. Thank you very much. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, Pring Officer. Pring Officer, uh, when I saw the title uh, of the two debates today, uh, I thought they might be quite serious uh, in nature, but uh, unfortunately, from the Tories' perspective, it was just more of that, kind of, one of those days of, kind of the knock about politics as compared to that aspect of being serious. Now, we heard the Tory claims earlier about the, the, the full life sentences for only under a Tory-led Scottish Government. 
And then this debate about Scotland's economy. Once again, we've had the Tories talking down Scotland's economy. Uh, it's talking down Scotland's economy, which is uh, unfortunate to feed into that narrative of the, of the, to feed into that narrative of the, of the so-called strong and stable Tories uh, actually know best. But I'll take your intervention. Dean Lockhart. Just to highlight to member, we're not talking down Scotland's economy, we're talking down the SNP's performance over the past 12 years, where we're seeing now a billion pounds whole in public uh, uh, finances, which will have a direct impact on public services here in Scotland. Stuart McMillan. Yeah. <sighs> Mr Lockhart obviously forgets, I mean, I mean, that's forecasts about the future. I mean, as we do already know, presenting officer, if the Tories actually were in power, there'd be a £500 million cut to Scotland's budget because of the Tories in terms of what they planned for the budget uh, this year. Now, let's actually look at the record. Under the SNP, Scotland's economy is growing faster than the rest of the UK. Under the SNP, unemployment is at a record low. Under the SNP, exports are growing faster than the rest of the UK. And under the SNP, productivity growth is outpacing the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, I think that's positive, but there is still more to do. It's not a bad record, but nobody can be complacent. Now, I know that the Scottish Government are certainly not complacent. But also, the biggest, the biggest threat to our economy is Brexit. And no matter how many legions of Tory MPs put their name forward to captain the political equivalent of the Titanic, it's clear to almost everyone that Brexit will have economic consequences for all parts of the UK, particularly if it's a no-deal Brexit. Now, just, just on, on the point uh, of, uh, of Brexit, uh, I don't know if the Tories are actually aware of this, uh, but certainly when we had the, the European elections, Scottish voters last month actually gave the Tories their worst result in a national election since 1865. Now, I think that kind of tells a story in terms of what the Scottish voters actually think about the Tories. Now, we've already heard certainly from the Tories uh, regarding the Scottish Fiscal Commission report of last week, but presenting also the SFC reduced their forecasts as a direct result of the continuing Brexit uncertainty, with the no-deal option worse than their current projections. I'm saying also that the Fraser Allender Institute have also suggested a no-deal uh, Brexit could actually push Scotland into a recession, and also highlighted the challenges to Scotland's economy. And I'm going to quote, it's, um, I'm going to quote uh, Brian, uh, uh, Graham Roy. And this, he said this, uh, it's actually on the ITV News website of the 18th of April. And it says, the lack of clarity about the UK's terms of exit from the EU continues to cast a shadow over day-to-day decision-making with businesses clearly struggling to make long-term plans in such times. Now, also, the Scottish Government analysis suggests Scotland will actually go into recession uh, and for unemployment to increase by up to 100,000 people. Now, Dean Lockhart in his comments earlier spoke about uh, uh, there was a dereliction of duty of any government to reduce skills and training of their young people. Now, I hope that's an admission of guilt from the Tories and also an apology from the Tories in terms of what they did to the population of Scotland and also the rest of the UK when they came into power in 1979 when they cut apprenticeships uh, across the board and introduced a YTS scheme. Sorry, no, I don't have any more time. I've taken one more uh, of you. Uh, and something also, also, I'm conscious of the time, something also, uh, Scotland does have a good story to tell, but there is still more to do. Liz Smith spoke about skill shortages earlier. Uh, and, and once again, it goes back to that point of when the Tories cut the apprenticeships and actually led to some of the skill shortages that Scotland and the UK has faced over the course of the last 20 to 30 years. Something else that there is still more to do, but I do encourage colleagues in the chamber to actually uh, to reject the Tories, just like the population of Scotland, uh, but also but to back the amendment in the name of this Scottish Government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Claire Adamson. And Ms Adamson will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Lindhurst. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This debate comes at a critical time for Scotland's economy. As convener of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee, I am acutely aware of the challenges facing our economy in the coming years. Representing the capital and the wider Lothian region as well, we are able to be at the heart of an economic revolution, but that will require a bold economic vision. It is clear that a skills shortage is severely hampering future growth prospects. That is why the Scottish Conservatives are using this debate to outline policy that is led by a focus on technology, innovation, global trade, employment and regional growth. We plan to introduce a new skills participation age so that everyone up to the age of 18 requires to either go to school, college, university, or 
if they want to start work, do so through a structured apprenticeship or a traineeship. There has been too much focus on pushing our youngsters through to university. Yes, it may be appropriate to go to university and that can work for many, but there needs to be a shift away from seeing vocational education as the poorer relation of the academic route. Briefly. I'm very grateful for the member giving way. Given the proposal he has outlined, would that still allow for 16 and 17 year olds who wish to start their own business independent of this scheme to do so? Gordon Lindhurst. Yes, it would do so. Returning to my thread of thought, with the IPPR in Scotland highlighting Scotland's worker shortage of 410,000 by 2030, we need to give businesses the support that will bolster skills training. The skills shortage has doubled since 2011 on the SNP's watch. 6% of employers reported skill shortage vacancies in 2018, with STEM employers' skills shortage vacancies also an increase. So I'm pleased that the UK government has provided £270 million for data skills training over the next decade as part of the Edinburgh and South East Scotland region deal. The Data Innovation Project will train 100,000 Scots and ensure that the country can be at the forefront of exciting technological advancements. This needs to be combined with a boost in productivity, which has been one of the SNP's greatest failures when it comes to our economy. Scotland has not progressed up productivity league tables, despite the hours Scottish workers working being the highest since 1998. It is time Scotland had an economic plan that gives a lifelong skills guarantee to anyone who wishes to retrain or upskill during their career. Supported by businesses, this will give them confidence that they can provide workers with greater opportunities, especially low-paid and low-skilled, whatever age or whatever stage of their career they may be at. During their 12 years in charge, the SNP government has presided over many failures when it comes to delivering for Scotland's economy. In 12 out of the last 15 economic quarters, growth across the UK has outpaced that in Scotland, a trend set to continue until 2023. Scotland's economy continues to stagnate under the SNP, who continue to create uncertainty with their plans for independence and referenda and make us the highest tax part of the UK and fail to seriously address the major skill shortage facing our economy. That is the challenge for the SNP in the coming years. Otherwise, Scotland's economy will continue to lag behind not only the UK, but other equivalently sized European nations. Thank you very much. I call Claire Adamson. Then we move to closing speeches. Ms. Adamson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've been listening with interest in the chamber this afternoon, and it really does seem that the Tories want to talk about everything but Brexit this afternoon. And essentially, no m mention of Brexit in their motion today. Um, it's, I think they, they really should reflect on their dreadful performance in the EU um, elections um, just a, a week ago. Dean Lockhart. The member uh, explained why the Fraser of Allender last week said that Brexit is a UK-wide issue. Can you explain why Scotland is underperforming the rest of the UK and will do so for the next five years? Claire Adams. I don't agree with the um, member's assertion about that and I don't agree that we, have, we cannot control all the powers that we need to grow Scotland's economy and I will outline reasons where the Westminster government have failed in, in that area. We're in a parliamentary chamber, it's not an echo chamber for the Tories' empty rhetoric in this area. If they won't listen to the verdict of the Scottish people, why don't they listen to our universities, our medical staff, our, our science and technology professionals who are telling us that the biggest threat for our economy going forward, the biggest threat to the skills gap is Brexit and the, the policies adopted by the UK government. It's, it's not just about the economy, it's an issue of demography. Scotland is facing a big demographic problem, one which is intrinsically tied to an economic future, Ending the freedom of moving, movement is not going to help. The hostile environment is certainly not going to help. Cancelling the post-study work visa for our universities certainly 
did not help. It's been reintroduced for some of the universities down south. Where's the equity for Scotland in that? I want to say that, as well, the, Scotland is being disadvantaged again because they talk about, in the, the context of Brexit, introducing three-year study visas for students, completely ignoring the fact that Scotland has a tradition of a four-year four post-undergraduate uh, uh, an undergraduate degree. The motion does mention growth. In 2018, GDP per person had grown more rapidly in Scotland than in the UK. It mentions productivity. In 2018, Scotland's pro productivity grew 3.8% compared to 0.5% in the UK as a whole. It mentions wages. In 2018, Scotland had the highest proportion of employees paid the real living wage than the other um, countries across the UK, a figure of 80.6%, and that's a success for Scotland. And it mentions skills. Well, last Friday, I was privileged to witness the prodigious talent on display at the SCDI STEM showcase in Glasgow. Young Engineers and Science Club's events was de a demonstration of the skills of the future. More than 300 young people representing 50 schools in Scotland, demonstrating the skills that will take us into the fourth industrial revolution. Supported by business, supported by the Institute of Chemistry, supported by the Royal Society of Chemistry. This was an excellent example of what we are doing to ensure the skills of the future are here in Scotland. And Dean Lockhart um, talked about second chance centres and vocational schools. I have to say to him, all of Scotland's schools are vocational schools because we are implementing the DWYW, the Developing the Young Workforce Programme. It still has to to run until 2021. Our schools are embracing that along with Curriculum for Excellence. So we see our young people being able to take up foundation apprenticeships in school, work in colleges in school, do vocational courses. And that is talked down as somehow as disadvantaging our young people by the Tory, Tory benches. Let's get behind Scotland. Let's get behind our pupils. Let's get behind our teachers. And let's get behind the spirit of the developing the young for workforce, which seeks to do exactly what your new ideas suggest, as if we're Excuse not doing me, just anything. A, just a minute, Ms Adamson. I'm job. listening to you, but two members of the front bench, I won't shame them, are talking across you, which is not polite, and I want them to stop. Yeah. Ms Adamson. We have a hulking spectre coming to us to haunt our doorsteps on Halloween, and it's Brexit, and it's times the Tories recognise the impact it's going to have on Scotland's economy. Thank you very much. I apologise for having to interrupt you, but they were just getting away with it, and that's not going to happen. Uh, now, closing speeches, I call Rhoda Grant. Four minutes, please. Close for Labour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In order to protect our citizens and build a fair country, we need to get the economy right. And to coin a phrase, it's the economy stupid. None of our aspirations can be realised without a fair and inclusive economy that meets the needs of our citizens. Without people working and paying taxes, we can't fund an inclusive welfare state. We see the failings of this daily. We also learned last week there's a black hole in the Scottish finances, and the only way to plug that is to build the economy. An economy built on fair pay and on secure employment. There are many opportunities to do that, but instead of capitalising on them, we watch many of those opportunities go abroad while our governments cause uncertainty at home with nationalistic constitutional wranglings. It's time the SNP refocused their efforts on domestic issues at hand rather than wasting time on a second independence referendum. We could be building our economy and instead they wish to cause further chaos and uncertainty. Well, Irene said Brexit was as bad as independence. But if Brexit is bad, independence is at least four times worse. Jamie, Jamie Hepburn talked about the constraints and the powers he had, but they cannot set up a welfare system in the time allowed, far less the institutions that we would need to run an independent country. They should aspire to use the powers they have before they ask for more. Very quickly. Minister? Uh, referred to, of course, was our fair work agenda, our ability to implement the real living wage as a statutory minimum wage, to repeal the Trade Union Act. Does the member regret the fact that the Labour Party opposed the devolution of employment law to this place during the Smith Commission process? Rhoda Grant. 
had, had, had it been devolved, devolved, I wonder if the Scottish Government would have been able to implement it. They haven't been able to implement a lot of the powers they got under the Smith Commission and they have, they have handed them back. So I have no confidence in them being able to implement um, any powers they get. Instead, they give us a cuts commission, a dec decade of austerity under independence, and they cut off their biggest trading partner. Uh, Richard Leonard told us 14.9 billion of trade with the EU, 48.9 million uh, trade with the UK. How can they think that our economy will work when we cut off our nearest neighbours? Richard Leonard talked about the need for an industrial strategy and the Scottish Labour Party is firmly be behind that. It should be a top priority for the Scottish Government and we believe it is time for a new approach to rebalance and grow our economy differently. Retaining and building on sectors that Scotland once thrived in and was proud of, uh, pursuing opportunities in new technology to broaden our e economic base and to help pave the way for, the, for a green industrial revolution. And it's quite sad that the STUC report has shown how past promises of employment in the low carbon and renewable energy economy have not been delivered. And sadly, in fact, numbers employed in that area have fallen. Many speakers talked about the skills gap and I would agree that, with that because our workforce need to be skilled and Alec Rowley talked about cuts to FE. It's not only young people that need skills in STEM subjects, it's also people who are working and need to reskill in order to keep up with new technologies. We cannot afford to leave anyone in our economy behind. Presiding officer, to create a fair society, we need to grow our economy. And I agree with Patrick Harvey that using GDP to measure this as progress leaves much to be desired. And we need to look at what New Zealand are doing in this area and look to see how we can implement something similar. However, we still need secure, well-paid jobs to build our economy and to share wealth and power. The Scottish Government has the levers to do this if they would only use them. Thank you very much. And I call on Kate Forbes to close for the Government. Minister, five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll start on a point of consensus. I think there have been some good ideas discussed and debated today. And the debate has focused in part on the Scottish Government's responsibilities for the economy. And I'm happy to concede that as the Scottish Government has partial responsibility for the economy, then we celebrate our role in record low unemployment, in exports growing faster than anywhere else in the UK, and productivity increasing. And as the EY Attractiveness Survey published today recognises, Scotland has proven strengths in terms of its record for attracting new investment and the perception of Scotland as an investment destination. And just under a year ago, Barclays announced it was setting up its tech hub in Scotland, creating over 2,500 new jobs. And last week, I welcomed the newest fintechs in Scotland. So there is a lot to celebrate. But, presiding officer, looking at independent research from the Fraser of Allender Institute or the Scottish Fiscal Commission, or in fact, speaking to most businesses right across Scotland, they identify two key strengths. The first is Brexit, as Stuart Macmillan and Gordon MacDonald outlined. But the second is particularly relevant in this debate, and that is restrictions on freedom of movement. And no matter how hard they spin it, no matter how hard Dean Lockhart tries to spin it or weasel out of it, it is the party and who brought this motion today who is responsible for that. Yes. Dean Lockhart. Uh, the Minister mentioned to Fraser Valander last week, and uh, this is a quote, Brexit is a UK-wide factor. The cuts to income tax forecast by the SFC arise because income tax receipts per head in Scotland are growing more slowly than elsewhere in the UK. Is this because the SNP has created a low-skilled and low-wage economy? Well, the fact, that, the fact that the Tories keep talking about a black hole and their misunderstanding of the whole concept of forecast shows that we should never let them near yeah, implementing yeah. economic policies. But the Fraser of Allender also shows also shows that a disorderly no-deal Brexit could push the Scottish economy into recession. And no matter how much Dean Lockhart tries to whitewash reality, he can't get away from that independent analysis. Now, Liz Smith actually talked, I thought, quite powerfully about the skills base and the need for STEM skills and with responsibility for digital skills 
I take a very keen interest in those matters. Tech is forecast to be the fastest growing sector in Scotland by 2024, and only last week I launched the new £1 million fund to reskill and uptrain people, targeting in particular those in low wage jobs or no job at all, but who have the aptitude so that we actually expand the workforce. And the point of all of this is that the pace of change and the changing nature of demand for skills means that government needs to be agile and quick to respond, not just this government, but indeed all governments around the world. But, presiding officer, with unemployment at a record low, with our outperformance of the UK, on the UK on overall unemployment, youth unemployment and women's unemployment, in light of those figures, immigration is important. And when I intervened, Dean Lockhart dismissed the need for immigration, which will not reassure the business community who say that the UK government's immigration policy is obstinate, economically illogical, and shows that the UK government is hell-bent on ignoring the business community. Those are not my words, those are quotes. Dean Lockhart. Very briefly, I, I actually stressed the importance of immigration going forward. What I said is the primary responsibility of your government to make sure young people here in Scotland are fully trained. And I, Minister. And I, and I don't dismiss the point of uh, adequate training, which is why I talked initially about the need to retrain and reskill. But Dean Holt Lockhart cannot just dismiss the end of the post-study work visa, yeah. the cap on earnings at 30,000, yeah. and the hostile environment as though that does not have a current and a present impact on our skills base, as Claire Adamson powerfully set out. And so, presiding officer, although we can dwell on the negatives, we are getting on with supporting the economy. Last month, we published a trading nation with a plan for growing Scotland's exports, which sets out how we will grow the value of Scotland's exports as a percentage of GDP from 20% to 25% over the next 10 years. Over the next year, we'll establish a Scottish National Investment Bank with funds for precursor activities of 130 million. We'll continue to support the Building Scotland Fund, which supports the Scottish economy through loans and equity investments. We've established the National Retraining Partnership. We've invested £6.3 million of capital to continue the delivery of the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. Presiding officer, as I close, the Tories came today with a wish list for a strong economy, but it is a wish list because it utterly ignores their role right now in jeopardising the economy and the well-articulated views of the business community. We don't have a wish list, we have an action plan. An action plan that is upskilling and retraining the workforce, that is boosting exports and that is supporting innovation. Thank you very much. And now I now call Julie Halker-Johnson to close the weekend services till decision time, Mr Halker-Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. We've had a number of debates in recent months looking at uh, aspects of Scotland's economy. We've looked at trade, we've looked at specific sectors such as energy, and we've looked all too briefly, unfortunately, at entrepreneurship. But all of these are only small parts of a far larger overall picture. In bringing forward today's debate, we wanted to consider the deeper structural challenges facing our economy, as well as the need for a fresh approach from government. Many of the problems are easy to identify. Scotland's predicted growth is set to lag behind that of the rest of the UK. Many employers report skill shortages in their sectors and have real concerns for the future too. And while we look to address the real issues Brexit undoubtedly forced us to face, we have a Scottish government obsessed, despite the Minister's rosy appraisal of Scotland's economy, with adding to that uncertainty, uncertainty by pushing a damaging second referendum on, and, uh, and building barriers with the UK, our largest trading partner. We know that Scotland must strive for economic growth. Yet business confidence is low and the various strategies that the Scottish Government have produced have resulted in little real progress. Just a far more cluttered landscape than now. We hear again and again that businesses, from businesses that the most important requirements for investment is a skilled workforce. And I'm sure many of us from across this chamber can agree on at least some of the principles that we need to value vocational education at least as much as we value the more academic routes. That there must be a real recognition that the labour market is changing that there are a few jobs for life, and that over their working age, most people will change jobs and even sector a number of times. That's why we've been... Uh, yes, well... Minister? I mean, would he recognise that these are things that the government recognises, which is why we've established the developing young workforce to tackle the uh, misperceptions about vocational education as opposed to academic education, and why, in terms of the wider challenges around 
having a skilled population. We have committed to the uh, new uh, skills action plan and also a national retraining partnership. Jimmy Halker Johnson. Well, I'm happy to look at where the Scottish Government has taken action and praised that, but you've had 12 years to get this right, and, for, and we're still in the situation we are now. And the problem is business don't think that it's going to get better in the future, and that's what you should be hearing. That there, there must be a real recognition that the labour market is changing, that there are few jobs for life. And that's why we believe that a lifelong skills guarantee is so important. It will acknowledge that many people will have more than one career in their lifetime, and the ability for all to reskill is becoming increasingly essential. And as Dean Lockhart spoke about, we want to see a new skills participation age, ensuring that everybody under 18 is in school, college, university, or receiving structured training while in work, that no young person is left behind. But, presiding officer, in several speeches in this chamber, I have emphasized the need for both a national and a local approach. While our economic statistics are generally national, they often neglect, as we heard in the Economy Committee, the underlying problem in Scotland's regions. For too many parts of Scotland, the experience of the last decade has been, uh, has been of being left behind. UK-wide measures such as building a national living wage have had an effect of making truly national impact, but the reach of many initiatives heralded in this chamber are often slow to reach. Foundation apprenticeships, for example, begin with a poor level of choice for pupils in many parts of Scotland outside of the central belt. Still today, there are shortcomings, with some frameworks simply unavailable in certain regions. And so more than ever, improving skills is an essential step forward towards uh, solving our productivity challenge, raising incomes and building a strong economy here in Scotland and across Scotland for future generations. There have been some insightful and some less insightful contributions today, and I'm sorry that I won't have time to cover all of them. Dean Lockhart spoke about how if Scot Scottish growth has even, had even kept pace with the rest of the UK over the last 12 years, then our economy would be £7 billion larger. He highlighted the staggering figure that whilst 43% of businesses in our competitor countries embed digital in their operations, only 9% of Scottish businesses do. And he laid out why we're proposing an institute of technology and e-commerce with the aim of supporting between 2,000 and 3,000 no, businesses sit down, every Mr. year. Please sit down, Mr. Halker Johnson. You're not at fault. It's the usual warning at this time from the presiding officers. Strolling into your, say, a lot of your pals is not on. I want to hear the closing speeches, and members who've been in the debate want to hear the closing speeches. So just wait till five o'clock. Thank you. I was just going to get louder and louder, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, uh, sorry. With the aim of supporting between 2,000 and 3,000 businesses every year to access new markets by moving their businesses onto a dedicated e-commerce platform. And Gordon Lindhurst highlighted the need to boost productivity. He acknowledged that despite the hours Scottish workers work being the highest since 1998, there has been no progression up the productivity league tables. And Liz Smith spoke about the immense potential for Scotland to lead the world in many different sectors, but also highlighted the challenges we face. She and Gordon Lindhurst both referred to the recent IPPR Scotland survey, which warns that by 2030, Scotland, uh, in Scotland, we risk being short of 410,000 skilled workers a skills gap that the Open University estimates costing Scottish organisations £350 million every year. And that's why it's so disappointing that at a time when we need young people to engage in more vocational courses, when we want to promote the crucial and rewarding route, and when we, want to, when we look, should be looking to create a parity of esteem between education and vocational paths, that the Scottish Government has failed to properly support an initiative like Newlands Junior College. This list is quite right, that initiatives like Jim McCall's must be a crucial part of our skills offering in the future, particularly engaging with those currently disengaged from our schools. Presiding officer, economy policy, economic policy is about facing, issue, facing into the future and seizing opportunities, rather than being overwhelmed by new challenges. In Scotland, we have many strengths, but we mustn't ignore our weaknesses either. In every generation since the Industrial Revolution, the speed of economic change has accelerated. It seems more than ever that the Scottish Government is simply failing to keep pace. As Rhoda Grant suggested, it's not just about the economy. Many of the privileges we enjoy as a society depend on our, depend on our economic success. We can look starkly at recent forecasts from the Scottish Fiscal Commission about the impact that weak growth in income tax revenues will have on Scottish budgets. For many years, the devolution settlement has almost completely sheltered administrations in this chamber from the impact of their economic decisions. That time has passed, and we now have a very immediate, very real need to invest in our economy. Yep. If government doesn't get it right, then the stark truth is that government will not be able to do or to provide the things that it currently does. 
and trying to squeeze the same out of, a, out of our devolved revenue powers will require more and more pain. That's why we need a workforce that has the skills to participate in current and emerging sectors. Why we need the support in place to ensure workers can retrain when required, whatever the stage of their working career. And why Scotland needs a Scottish Conservative government that is willing and able to take on the opportunities of the future and to build an economy that works for all of Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. John Harper Johnson. That concludes this afternoon's debate on realising Scotland's potential. And we're going to turn straight to decision time. Uh, before the first vote, I would just remind members that if the amendment in the name of Hamza Youssef is agreed to, then the amendment in the name of Pauline McNeill will fall. So the first question is that amendment 17503.2 in the name of Hamza Youssef, which seeks to amend motion 17503 in the name of Liam Kerr, on whole life custody sentences be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17503.2 in the name of Hamza Youssef is yes 70, no 28. There were 18 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The amendment in Polly McNeill's name therefore falls. And the next question is that motion 17503 in the name of Liam Kerr as amended on whole life custody sentences be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division once more. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17503 in the name of Liam Kerr as amended is yes 88, no 28. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 17504.3 in the name of Jamie Hepburn, which seeks to amend motion 17504 in the name of Dean Lockhart on realising Scotland's potential be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17504.3 in the name of Jamie Hepburn is yes 59, no 51. There were six abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 17504.4 in the name of Richard Leonard, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Dean Lockhart to be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 17504.4 in the name of Richard Leonard is yes, 51, no, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The final question is that Motion 17504 in the name of Dean Lockhart, as amended on realising Scotland's potential, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Or not agreed? Members may vote. Members may cast their votes now. The vote on motion 17504 in the name of Dean Lockhart as amended is yes 59, no 51. There were six abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to a member's business debate in the name of Richard Lyle uh, on the Alzheimer's Scotland report on advanced on uh, delivering fair dementia care for people with advanced dementia and we'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats. <laughs>